Hello and welcome to the fifth and final video of the Basics of Audio Technology training series. Again, if you have not watched the introductory video, please stop and go watch that now so that you understand what this video series is all about. But without further ado, we're moving forward with proper care of equipment. And so the first piece of equipment that I'm going to talk about is probably the most overlooked piece of equipment, and that is your ears. And it's really because we don't think of our ears as a piece of equipment, but our ears are the most important piece of working in a band or working in audio because your ears give you reference to everything that's going on around you. And if you have hearing loss or damage, you're not going to be able to perform your job as well as others can. Yes, you can have things like hearing aids and things to assist you, but some hearing damage will just make it impossible to do things as well as others can. It's just going to make it really hard. On top of that, Ears can't get fixed. Um, if you have hearing loss, you're going to have hearing loss forever. Um, hearing aids can't help that, but you really just can't fix your ears. So the most important thing is to maintain and take proper care of yourself and your ears. And so what I like to do is follow the OSHA guidelines. They're listed on page 15 of the book, showing at which decibel levels um, you can listen to for how long. And you want to be aware of that in all things. Uh, luckily, technology has come a long way, and even Apple Watches and other watches will give you alerts to when you're listening to things for too loud for too long. But keep in mind, again, the inverse square law that we talked about. I get a lot of questions, how loud should something be like in a church service? But remember the inverse square law. So if up front, you know, 30 feet from the speakers, it's a perfect, great volume, it's very safe. Go to five feet in front of the speakers where some people might be standing. It's going to be a very unsafe level. So you have to weigh the pros and cons of what volume you're setting at and what is the greater population um, getting to their ears and is it safe for them, not only for yourself, but for other people as well. And so the first thing is just take care of your ears. Now, following along the same line as your ears of equipment, just remember personal safety as well. Accidents do and always will happen, but just slowing down, thinking through your situation, and taking a few steps of precaution can really help to reduce those accidents and take care of not only yourself, but other people. And so some of the things to think about uh, with personal safety first is just uh, proper electrical grounding. As we talked about with cables, we know that there's three conductors, one of which holds the ground. Um, and when we run phantom power through a cable, we're providing 48 volts of electricity. Now, if your system is ungrounded properly somewhere, you can run into the risk of electrocuting people. And there have been known stories of that happening. Um, and you also run the risk of fires as well. And so we don't want to burn down the building that we're working in. And we definitely don't want to be shocking people. I remember when I was in college, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. We were hooking things up. Um, somebody had pulled the ground pin out of the cable that went to the bass guitar amp. And as of the basis was playing, our building was very not well grounded, and they would get shocked occasionally as they were singing through a phantom powered microphone. Um, and so now I know that was a very unsafe situation. And so if anything like that ever happens, you need to stop and just make sure uh, that everything is done well and you have everything properly grounded. And again, never pull the ground pin out of an electrical cable at, for any reason. Um, and if need be, hire an electrician, have them come in and make sure that everything is good. Um, and also, Along the lines of hiring somebody, we tend to want to save a lot of money and um, install a lot of things on our own, and that also includes flying speakers. Um, so hanging speakers from the ceiling or mounting them on walls. Whenever you do something like that, unless you know exactly what you're doing, I highly recommend always hiring somebody to come in, do the math, and make sure that it is safe. And anytime you do hang something up, make sure that it's always backed up. Just in case something does fail, there's always a backup so things are not going to fall on people and hurt people. And lastly, the most simple thing that we can do, and it happens all the time, is just laying cables down flat, having good cable management on a stage, making sure that they're routed properly, taping them down, or putting covers in heavily trafficked areas so people won't trip. People trip over things, not only can they hurt themselves, but they can also break equipment, and we don't want that to happen. And so, again, with all of this, just take time, think of your situation, and just use common sense, and you can stop a lot of accidents from ever happening. And so that's really it for personal safety. So now we're going to move on into equipment care. And I'm going to start by just listing off a few things to think about, and then move into some examples of equipment care. 
So the first thing is, again, electrical considerations. Um, because again, running fan and power, everything, all audio and a cable is just electricity. And so we have to be aware of that. And so the first thing is uh, when using fan and power on a microphone. And so the best uh, practice is to always by default have fan and power turned off all the time. And then only when you need fan and power on a microphone, turn it on only after the microphone has been plugged in. Because all these pins and everything in a cable, they're not exact same it's not perfect and so you can cause things to short out if you're sending power to it and then plugging it in and you can break microphones that way again uh i called just remember we talked about ribbon microphones fan and power going to a ribbon microphone can potentially break that microphone but other microphones can get shorted out uh, just depending on their design and how your system is working and so by default just leave fan and power turned off and again only turn it on after you've plugged in the microphone and you know that microphone requires phantom power. The next thing is turning systems on and off. Um, and so first, just making sure that your system has adequate power to it. Yes, we know that 120 volts is supposed to come out of the wall, but sometimes it's not exactly 120 volts. And so you want to check up on that because over the course of a couple years or so, you can really damage equipment if it's over... Um, overpowered or underpowered and so you can have power conditioners that read the current voltage to you and make sure that everything's powered well um, but when turning systems on and on on and off uh, you probably have seen uh, the problem where speakers get turned on and then somebody turns on the soundboard and you get this loud pop um, that's very easily avoided all you need to do and when turning on a system is turn on the console first and then the speakers and then when you're turning it off turn off the speakers first and then the console. And the reason that you get that pop is because again, audio is just electricity. And if you turn on the console, either fan of power might've got left on or just the surge of power going through the console will send a surge of electricity through those XLR cables, through the digital snakes, through all of that and can come in the form of a loud pop on your speakers. Now, once or twice, that's not gonna be a big deal, but if you do that repeatedly, day after day after day on certain systems, that pop eventually is gonna wear down the drivers and the speakers and greatly reduce the life of your speakers, and we don't want that to happen. So, and the second reason for turning on power correctly is sometimes that loud can be very, that pop can be very loud and if somebody's really close to the speaker it can not only one scare them but number two it can also cause hearing damage just depending on how loud it is so again to turn on the system turn on the console first then the speakers and to turn it off you just do it in the reverse the speakers power amps and then the console and the best thing to do um even if you even when turning on power, the best thing to do is just to have a distribution system. A distribution system that it's one key turn or one flip of a switch and it turns everything on in a, um, in a specific pattern. And so they will also do that pattern as you turn it off as well. So that is taking care of equipment and just electrical considerations. Now, a lot of the equipment or all of the equipment that we're using is electro electrical and it's electronics. And dust is one of the number one killers of all electronic things. Uh, dust can get inside of faders, get behind buttons. It can cause shorts between things as it connects to others. Um, dust will also clog up the fans uh, because remember electrical things emit heat over time electrons are flowing and they will build up heat and so a lot of equipment has fans in it to cool down equipment but if dust gets in there and clogs up the fans it's going to overheat and not only will break your equipment but again can go towards um, potentially starting a fire again and so always 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 make sure that you are either covering equipment that has to stay out or equipment that's in a closet, just make sure that you're either blowing out the dust or using a static free vacuum and vacuuming out the dust on a regular basis. I would recommend at least once a year going through all your equipment and cleaning it and removing any dust, but depending on your circumstances, you may need to do that more than once per year. Uh, the other thing is proper storage. Um, thinking about temperatures and humidity. Again, we are working with electronics. So if you are placing uh, your equipment in a place that is very humid, um, that could have an adverse effect on your equipment. Alternatively, I know that a lot of churches have to be uh, mobile and they store all of their things in a trailer. And so just be aware that by storing things in a trailer, if it's outside in the summer sun, uh, it can get really, really hot in a trailer. And some... Um, 
some soldering points on electronics can become loose and melt and that heating and cooling process over and over again will greatly reduce the life of your equipment. So if you have no choice and you have to keep it in a trailer, that's fine. But just be aware that some of that equipment might break down a lot faster than if it would if it were stored in a temperature controlled and humidity controlled environment. Uh, the next thing for equipment care is your speaker drivers. I know a lot of people just buy speakers and they never touch them and they set them up and they leave them forever. Uh, but speaker drivers do wear out over time. And so that's something that can be easily replaced. You can probably do some of them yourself, but if you don't know how to do that, you can send them off to get your drivers replaced. And your drivers really should get replaced every four to six years, just depending on how much they've been used. And so if you've had a speakers for a decade and you haven't touched them and they're starting to sound a little off, maybe consider um, replacing the drivers rather than buying a new set of speakers and it might breathe new life into your speakers. And again, with speakers, also cleaning off the dust, making sure the dust doesn't build up up on the diaphragms and stuff like that will also help your speakers, especially if they're active speakers and have cooling fans within them. And the last thing for proper equipment care is just your microphones. Just think about where you're storing them, how you're storing them. Uh, if you think of a microphone, most have built-in windscreens, so a really thin piece of like foam or fabric that keep debris from going in, but most importantly, keep uh, plosives from happening. But over time, if you have a singer, a lot of moisture and buildup and bacteria is going to grow on those windscreens. And so I really recommend uh, cleaning those and washing those, or if you need to, just replacing them all together. Many of the many popular brands of microphones sell windscreen replacements. So after a certain amount of time, you just screw it off, buy a new one, put it on, and you're good to go. But I would recommend cleaning those often as they will grow bacteria. They can become smelly and discolored, and it's not a great thing. And uh, always remember, because there is moisture in your microphone after it's been used for singing, uh, maybe let it sit out for a little bit before you put it into an enclosed box with no airflow to it. That will also help reduce the chance of like rusting and decaying on the inside, but then also breeding bacteria. And so really those are the few things I have for equipment care and just considerations to talk about. But in all things, just take your time, think about the world around you, use common sense, and just take a little extra time to make sure some things are done well. And so from here on out, I'm gonna go to um, some example videos of coiling cables, setting up microphone stands, speaker stands, how to move things around, um, and just some general things to think about when um, laying cables on a stage. So the first thing I'm going to go over is cable management. How to keep your cables looking like this to looking nice and neat like this. Doesn't matter how much time you've spent in the audio video world or on a band or with a team of some sorts, the first thing that you really should learn to help and uh, be a benefit to your group is to learn how to coil a cable. And so the first thing is if you don't already, you need to invest in cable ties. Because even if you coil a cable nice and neat like this, if you don't have something to keep it together, as soon as you put it on a box or you hang it up, they're all gonna get uh, jumbled together and then you're just gonna end up with one big rat's nest in a box or something like that. And it's gonna be a horrible knotted mess. So the first thing to do is invest in cable ties. You can either get the Velcro type ones um, that are electronic safe. Don't actually go get actual Velcro, the thick poofy stuff. Um, it'll stick to everything. You wanna get electronic safe stuff like this. It's really simple and easy, it comes in different sizes, and you can usually find it at like Lowe's or Home Depot or Amazon. Uh, or you can just get bulk string, tie a bit on there, and then every time you wrap it around and tie it like you're tying your shoe. I do find that Velcro strips are a lot easier and faster to work with. So the first thing you do is learn how to coil a cable. And if you remember from other chapters, cables um, have multiple conductors in it. So it's one cable is made up of different conductors. And so in an XLR, XLR or microphone cable such as this one, um, you're going to have three conductors in there. And those wires inside of here are all spun together. Uh, they're not just going in straight through that, through the, through the rubber housing. And so because of that, this cable is going to have a natural tendency to want to curl up on itself just like that. And that is what you're going to be, want to be working with when cables, when you're coiling cables. And every cable has its own different kind of coiling point, and you'll just have to work with what you have. Um, some have really tight coils, and they want to, 
you know, bend really small, depending on how thick the gauge is of uh, the cable, but you're just going to have to practice. And so the first thing to do is get your cable all untangled. This one's pretty easy to get undone because it was already nice and neat. And in one hand, you're going to hold it, and that's going to be your static end. On the other hand, this is going to be the part that you move. So what I like to do is take it and give it kind of just like, like a quarter of a twist, and you'll see that it naturally wants to coil up like that. But obviously, this coil's a little too small because if I keep going like that, it's going to become a huge mess. And it's going to get lots and lots of coils, and that could be a bad thing for what I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. So I like to get kind of just a normal shoulders width apart and coil that. And that typically, just a little bit more than shoulders width apart, um, that typically is about a pretty good coil that you're going to work with. So again, static end, take this and you're going to rotate it. I rotate it outwards, just a quarter of a turn, you come together, grab some more, quarter of a turn, back together again, and you repeat and do that over and over again. And you'll see that sometimes it wants to coil in the opposite direction. That's okay, as long as it's laying flat, nice and neat. And I'll tell you why in just a little bit. So once you get your cable coiled all the way, nice and neat, you take your tie and you tie it all together again. Now, this is the, uh, the number one method of doing it for cables, I would say 25 feet and under. And the reason for that is, is uh, every time you're coiling it, you're adding a quarter turn to it. So, if I were to just take this and drop it and start pulling on it, as you can see, it kind of leaves coils in it that get stuck because it's continually going in the same direction. So if I keep pulling, you'll see more of those coils. See these little things? They're going to be there. And over long distances, they're not going to work themselves out. And they're going to create kinks and loops that people can trip on and step on, and it's not good for the cable. So anything under 25, I say it's okay. And I think a lot of people would agree to just go overhand the whole way. Um, because those loops and stuff that you're going to get, it's such a short distance that it will kind of work its way out, um, and it'll be okay. But anything over 25 feet, especially like 50-foot cables and beyond, you're going to want to do what's called the over-under method. And so here I have a 50-foot cable. And it's been done in the over-under method. So, let me find the end. And when I lay it down, and I pull, it's going to come out flat no matter what. Because I've been doing it in a way that quarter turns one way, one coil and then quarter turns the opposite way on the other one. And I'll show you how to do that here. The over-under method takes a lot more practice um, and it can also tend to cause knots like this if you don't take it apart. Like if you just took it and throw it, um, if it's not coming from the top like the way you coiled it, it can end up with a lot of knots. So that can be a problem too. So you just have to be a little more careful and a little more patient when it comes to a cable that you use the over-under method for. So you start the exact same way. In your hand, you take, and also because it's going to be a longer cable, there's going to be more to it. I like to go a little longer than normal, so just a little bit larger loops. So the first one, I'm going to spin it away from myself a quarter of a turn. And I come out, get another one, and then I'm going to spin it towards myself a quarter of a turn, and I'm going to go inside of itself like that. And so over, and then under, it's going to go behind itself, over, under, again behind, not behind the entire loop, because that would knot it up really bad, but just in, time, in front of this cable here. And so over, under, right there, over, under, and as you practice and practice, this will become much quicker. Now this is just one way that you can do over under. A lot of people do it different ways based on what hand they are, uh, different styles of doing it. You can do it on the floor. Uh, this is just the way that I prefer it, but the technique is still the same. You're going to go one way over, one way under. So a quarter of the turn one direction, a quarter of the turn the other direction. And again, the purpose of that is so that when you pull the cable apart, you're not going to end up 
with coils left in it poking up off the ground for people to trip on. And then when you're done, again, you go back to the Velcro tie and you just tie it all together. And Velcro ties, again, are really pivotal to keeping uh, cables nice and neat and clean because if you hang it up, it's going to keep it nice. If somebody bumps it, it's going to fall down. It'll stay together. It's not going to come apart. And at the same time, if you keep it in a box stacked on a lot of other cables, um, if you don't have cable ties, you pull on one end, it's going to come through another one, and it's just going to, cue, uh, it's going to make one huge knot. And so those are the two ways of coiling cables. Uh, there is one more way um, when you're using really thick gauge cables, say like a snake or something like that, and you could do a figure eight pattern. And so I'll show you just really quickly just the idea of what that is. And when you do the figure eight pattern, you're going to want to do it inside of a box. So if it's a big snake, you put it inside of a box, you start with one end out of the box, and it really is just doing what it says. You're making a figure eight pattern. So start up here. Go around, and I'm going to exaggerate it so you can hopefully see it on the floor. Just let's imagine this was one big giant cable. You bring it and you make a figure eight just like this. And as you can see, these coils, just like I said they would, they're keeping it in there. I personally over under every single cable that I do, um, but general rule of thumb, 25 foot, it's okay. And so as you can see, I'm just going back and forth in a figure eight pattern with the cable. And so let's just imagine that this, and I'll show you the figure eight, um, but again, let's just imagine that this was a giant snake, really thick, you put it in a box, and you're gonna do a figure eight pattern. And when you're doing the figure eight pattern, it's doing a quarter of a turn in one way, and then it does it the other way. So you're not gonna get that continual coiling motion. The last thing that you would wanna do with a really thick um, cable like a snake or something like that is put it in a box and continually coil it in the same direction You definitely want to go figure eight or you want to go over under it's a little harder with big gauge cables to do over under um, But it does take up less room than figure eight. So either way with huge cables You want over under or figure eight? I personally like figure eight because it's easier to wrangle with you just go back and forth and you don't have to worry about coiling under and the over and back and forth uh, but you definitely want to do that for a large cable like a snake or something like that um, but that's it that is cable management and if you can learn how to cable how to coil a cable like a pro you will impress everybody and everybody will love you for it in this next example I'm going to show you probably the number two thing that you're going to be working with uh, that you need to learn how to work and properly take care of because they break super easily depending on the ones you have um, so microphone stands or this one's a boom stand because it has a boom that comes off of it. Um, you're going to be working with these a lot and they break all the time. And it's really easy to keep them from breaking. All you have to do is just common sense and take an extra two seconds to properly take care of it. And so this is a microphone stand that's been collapsed down all the way to the way it should be. And what I mean by that is on the end here, you don't have the bottom piece poking out. So that way you don't damage or break anything because on a lot of cheaper microphone stands these are pretty rough and sharp and i'll talk about that in a little bit and you have the rubber bumpers protecting everything then at the top you have it broken down as much as possible and then folded down on itself so that the mic clip is on the um the, the upright part and that's important because if it's not or if the i like i see a lot of people who do it the opposite way where they spin it around I'll show you real quick. They keep the microphone clip at the top and they store it like this. That can be all right too if you're in a place where it just stands in a closet, but if you're a mobile setup and you're going back and forth, if you do this a lot, it's gonna hit, it's gonna bump into stuff, and you're just gonna end up breaking your clips and having to replace them a lot. So the best thing to do is do it the opposite way, bring it all the way down and clip it onto itself. And now it's in safe, nice and neat, out of the way, everything's collapsed down as much as possible and this is the proper way of putting a microphone stand away now when you're setting up a microphone stand it's really simple or at least one would think but there's a lot of things that you can do wrong uh, the first thing is over tightening um, a lot of the pieces especially on cheaper models of microphone stands um, aren't built well or built out of really high quality metals and such that can take a beating 
And so when you over tighten things, you can put dents and divots and stuff. You can strip out, um, especially strip out the screws in here if they're made out of cheap metals. Um, and so the number one thing is just do not over tighten. Um, but when you put out the base, when you set down the base of a microphone stand, it's really important that you go down all the way before tightening. And why that's important is because, like I said earlier, the bottoms of some stands are not smoothed out, they're not flattened, and they're really sharp and jagged. And I see a lot of people that set up a stand, they get it down so that the bottom part of this is sticking out and it's touching the ground. Now that's a problem because if you come across a cable, and I have seen this happen to a nice guitar cable, somebody moved the stand, they put it on there, put it down really hard, and it just cut through the cable because it was a really cheap stand, it was sharp, and it just cut straight through the cable. The other thing is that when you do that, it has a lot of motion. Let me back up so you can see. It has a lot of motion because it's pivoting on that upright piece. If you get that all out of the way, then it's just standing on the tripod itself and it's a lot more stabilized and better for you. So put down the base all the way and make sure to tighten it securely, but do not over tighten. The next thing to do when setting up a microphone stand is to properly loosen everything as you're setting it up. Uh, probably one of the worst things you can do, and you see everybody do it, when a microphone stand is up, it's tightened, they just grab it and they move it and they yank it. So if you look on the inside of a microphone stand, all these different pieces, uh, again, it depends on what kind of stand you have. If it's cheap, it's going to break a lot quicker. But these are just little rubber pads. And if you're taking and you're just forcing it down, you're going to be wearing down this rubber over and over again to the point where you're going to permanently bend the metal that's clamping it down um, and wear out the metal, but then the rubber gaskets are going to be gone and you're going to have to continually be replacing those. So the best thing to do is properly loosen it, get it to where you need to go, and then tighten it. But again, remember, do not over tighten. And then when you're working with the boom, again, loosen it up properly before moving it out. And another good practice to, to get into is to properly counterweight your microphones. And what I mean by that is leaving some weight on the other side. A lot of people like to keep microphones extended as far as they can so that they can get as far away from the base as possible. But when you do that and you put a pretty hefty, nice quality microphone on the top, depending on where your tripod's situated at, it's going to be very top heavy and going to want to lean over and create problems for yourself. So the best thing to do is just keep some of that weight on the other side as a counterweight so it's not as top heavy. There's some weight on the other side to keep it more balanced so you lower the risk of dropping, uh, of, uh, dropping a microphone on the stand and breaking a microphone. And so when you do tighten everything, I remember do not over tighten. And again, I've seen many times that these screws in microphone stands, as you can see, it's just a little screw in here. They're made out of cheap metals. And so if you over tighten, um, some of them, they screw into plastic pieces. If you over tighten or you're not careful when you're tightening them, they will strip and then you have to buy replacements. Or if you can't find replacements, you just have to buy a brand new stand. And the last piece, um, you can also adjust the height. Remember, loosen it properly, get it to where you need to go, and then tighten it down, but don't over tighten. And the last piece is a, a microphone clip. And this is where I see a lot of people uh, ruin a lot of clips, especially cheaper clips, like I said, that are threaded with plastic. There are still some clips out there that are threaded with plastic. And the worst thing that you can do is put on a microphone, have your microphone there, and then try to thread and spin your entire microphone. The best thing to do is just loosen up the boom, get it on there, and then give it a one turn backwards just to seat it in place, and then you start just finger tightening. And if you come across any resistance and you find yourself cranking on it, you really need to check that you're not cross-threading and stripping these threads and you're ruining your microphone clip. And that's it for setting up a microphone stand. And again, it's really easy to um, mess this up. All you have to do is over tighten to move it without loosening it up first and then putting the upright piece down to the ground. 
Um, just take the extra two seconds to loosen things, make sure that you're not over tightening, and those extra two seconds all the time can make all the difference in the world. So rather than replacing a microphone stand once every single year, you can replace a microphone stand once every 10 years. And it really um, lengthens the life of your microphone stands. And your, <laughs> your church, the budget, will uh, definitely like you for it. And so that's how to set up a microphone stand. In this next example, I'm going to show you how to properly take care of a speaker stand. It's a lot similar, uh, a lot more similar to a microphone stand in a lot of ways, but just a little um, minute differences. But again, the biggest thing is just don't, don't over tighten things and just take two seconds, think about it, and really take care of your stands. Uh, this is a really cheap stand that's taken a beating. Um, it's not the best one, it's missing some rubber feet, uh, so it's not the most stable because it's a little off and it doesn't grip on. Uh, flat surfaces, but it's good for practice purposes. So again, loosen things up before moving them, and you want to move down the legs. There are different models and types of speaker stands, so again, just like with everything, get to know what you're working with. Now, when it comes to speaker stands, um, they have adjustable bases. You can go out pretty wide, or you can go out pretty narrow, and you might be wondering, well, what's the best thing to do? Um, you always have to weigh your uh, scenario with how to set up your speaker stand. So if space is really tight and you have no option and it's really up against the wall, you have to go pretty narrow, well you just have to do it. But if space is not an issue, the best thing to do is to make the base as wide as possible. And wide as possible means that these support bars are going to be parallel with the ground. So when you get to that position, the base of the speaker is going to be as wide as possible. And so why do you want to go as wide as possible? That's because you're putting sometimes a really heavy up to 50 pound, mi um, not microphone, a 50 pound speaker on top of this. And the last thing you want is for the wind or somebody to trip over a cable and have that speaker uh, fall over onto somebody or hurt somebody or just break the speaker itself. So you want the widest, sturdiest base possible to keep it from knocking over. And so again, you tighten it down. Uh, speaker uh, stands, you want to tighten down just a little more because, again, you're going to have a lot of weight, but don't over tighten it because there are a lot of plastic pieces on some cheaper ones. And then with the top, it's pretty simple. You loosen, you get it to the right height that you want, and then always, always use a safety backup. So if your pin gets lost or stolen or anything, just replace it with, a, uh, with another one or... Uh, Anything that you can find that will take the weight and be okay. You don't want to stick like a pencil or something really cheap in there because it's not going to do anything for you. You want some solid metal as your pin. And again, that's because these parts that you're tightening, they're made out of plastic, they have rubber gaskets, they can fade over time. And if you put something really heavy on there, it can slide over time. And if you have your safety pin in there, it's going to keep it from moving no matter what. And so that's how to set up a speaker stand a lot more simpler than a microphone, but same concept. Don't over tighten, and you want to work on your bass. Um, and again, it all goes with what scenario you're in. So if you have to use a smaller bass, just be aware. Um, tape down your cables, make sure the space is safe. Um, maybe back up the speaker, tie it up to something, hook it up so you know it's not going to fall down. And that is how to set up a speaker stand. Okay, and so this example, I'm going to combine uh, cable management with microphone stand. What do you do once you've taken all the precautions and you've routed all your cables and your stage is nice and neat? What do you do when you get to the microphone stand itself? There's a lot of different thoughts and people do it lots of different ways, but I'm just going to walk through just the process and the thought process of how I do it, the way that I do it. Um, so the first thing you might notice on some stands, there's clips, little plastic clips that keep the microphone stand all nice and neat. So the wire is on there, and it's great. Uh, clips are nice because they're really quick. You can take them off, put them on, there you go. Uh, but the reason I like clips is because they get lost easily, but then they really don't help against one thing. Uh, my pet peeve is if your stage isn't clean and that's somebody tripping over the cable and potentially knocking over a microphone stand. And depending on what scenario you're in, that could be a really expensive microphone for somebody. You know, microphones can be cheap, but the, you know, this could be like a $600, $900 microphone on there. So you really want to take care of that. And so again, even if you do have the cleanest stage and the best cable routing, like accidents do happen. And so we're just trying to mitigate those accidents and not costing ourselves. So I don't like to use clips because the clips, if somebody 
falls on the cable, the clip can just pop right off, pop right off here, and then you have direct tension coming from that cable as somebody's tripping over it, bringing down the microphone stand. So I personally don't like to use, clip, use clips because again, you can lose them and they pop off easily. So what I do is I like to coil the cable around the stand. Um, but you want to be careful with this. Like we talked about before, you are pumping electricity through a cable of wire and you're wrapping it around a metal pole. And that is going to create more uh, radio frequency interference because you're essentially just making an antenna. Um, so you don't want to do it a bunch of times. Plus, if you wrap it around a bunch of times and you have to move it or make adjustments, it's going to be a pain for the singer. So what I like to do is wrap it around once, maybe twice on the bottom, bring it up, and wrap it around once, maybe twice on the top, and then connect to the microphone. And then afterwards, I would just want to adjust and make sure that I have some slack there. So if there does need to be adjustments made, they can adjust the microphone with no problem. Say they need to go back and forth some or come out, especially if they need to come out more. They have plenty of room to work with, so they can come out as far as they want, and there's not going to be any issue. Yes, it might look a little unsightly, but it's going to help uh, whoever's using that, especially in volunteer scenarios where people are changing in out week after week. Uh, just leave some slack. And then when I come down to the bottom, I like to make sure that I put just one little loop on one of the legs towards the back. And again, the reasoning for this is if somebody trips over a cable, so if somebody trips over a cable and it hits pretty hard, all of the force is down on the ground and it's most likely going to pull the microphone stand as a whole rather than with using clips or not using a clip or not wrapping at all, it's going to be pulling from the top and bringing the stand over on itself. So, Microphone cables and a microphone stand. This is the way I like to do it. I really recommend that you do it too. It takes two seconds to set up, two seconds to tear down, especially if you're not wrapping it more than a couple times. It's as simple as that. Now, the next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, moving microphone stands when they're already connected. Um, so the best thing to do when you're routing cables to your microphone stand is, like I said, wrap around once or twice, leave some slack at the top, but it's also a really good practice and habit to get into leaving some slack on the bottom. And so here you're going to want to do the over under method. So that way, if you need to move the stand, you can move the stand as much as you like on the go without having to worry about coils being left behind from just going overhand. And I like to keep that little extra slack right under the stand so it's out of the way. And then you have a nice, neat system so nobody's going to trip over it. But the other thing when moving microphones, remember, you can be using really expensive microphones. And I see so many times people just moving stands and it's just waving around and they don't, they're not paying attention to what to do, uh, what they're doing. So the best thing is just take one hand, just be extra cautious, secure the microphone and move the stand as a whole because you're, you're really aware of where your hand is at all times. And that's going to keep you from bumping into people, hitting people, and potentially breaking a really expensive microphone. And so that's what I do um, for routing cables to a microphone stand and moving a microphone stand. All right, in this last example, I'm going to go over very briefly just some cable management things for a stage. The first thing here is the stage pot uh, or box or whatever you call it. They're called many different things. Um, and they come in different shapes and sizes and different versions, but unfortunately for us in this version, we do have to be care careful about cutting cables. So what I mean by that is if a cable is off to the side and it closes, if anybody is to step on that with even just a little bit of force, it can cause these cables to be cut right in half. And it has happened before here on this stage. And so just be aware of that. And so the other thing with pots is they have a lid for a reason. The lid needs to be shut to prevent dust and debris from getting inside. As you can tell, this is a pretty dirty one because it's been left open quite a bit. And over time, that dust and debris will get inside the XLR connectors and will cause it to short out or not get a good connection. You'll have to blow it out with compressed air or use a static free vacuum to clean it out every once in a while. Also with this pot, you can see there are electrical outlets in it. I would recommend having pots that are separate, you know, electrical outlet pots and audio pots, but obviously we couldn't do that here. So in a case like this, I would recommend always routing your power out one end and your audio 
out the other end, again, to avoid electromagnetic interference. And so if you do that, you can have a nice clean out with all your cables. And then just when we're using um, and we're routing cables on a stage, I like to go and put everything at 90 degrees and lay everything flat right next to each other, right, not right on top of each other. This allows you to very easily and quickly see where things are routed to and it helps with troubleshooting. Uh, you're not taking a lot of trying, you're not going to be wasting a lot of time trying to untangle cables and figure out from point A to point B where things are going. You can just at a glance see where things are going and swap out cables very quickly. Um, the other thing and the other reason for laying cables out flat is so that you can easily tape them down if need be if they're in a heavily trafficked area but then and really but really the most important thing is to try and mitigate tripping people tripping over cables is not only bad for people's health but it can break a lot of equipment it can knock over microphones it can pull uh, cables out of jacks it can break speakers it can break lots of things and so we just try to mitigate tripping and that's really one of the most important reasons for cable management on a stage is for people's and equipment safety and so fortunately on our stage we have pots in in lots of different areas but let's say for example there was not a pot here on the front and we wanted to connect uh, you know two di boxes and a microphone cable here like we have right in front of us but we only had a pot in the back it'd be very tempting to run a cable to each location to where we need to go. You know, the shortest route from point A to B is a straight line. But again, we're trying to mitigate tripping and hazards. And so we want to keep the cables going together as much as possible and route them to places where there's not going to be a lot of traffic. And so if we go straight from point A to point B, it's going to be right where this performer is going to be standing. And they're going to be standing and trampling all over this cable. And that's going to wear down the life of the cable. So the best thing to do is group cables together and go the long way and find a place where there's not going to be a lot of traffic. So here in between the keyboardist and the guitar player it would be a perfect place to just route cables if need be. And again, if you need to route electric outlets and stuff to power um, pedals or things like that, just keep them spaced just a little bit so that you don't have electromagnetic interference, but you do want it to go group together with the other cables so that you are reducing the chance of tripping and causing a hazard and potentially breaking equipment. And so that's basically it for stage management. You just want to try and keep as clean and neat of a stage as possible to have um, a safe environment, but also keep uh, the life of your equipment longer. Okay, so hopefully those examples really help you understand how to coil cables, set up and tear down microphone stands and speaker stands, and just think about the stage management and cable management and things that you're doing. Um, this will really help you reduce or increase the life of your equipment so you don't have to repeatedly buy them over and over again. And I know that whoever is working with your budget and your bank account will appreciate that. So like I said, this is the fifth and final video of this training series. I really hope that you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below or email me. I hope to reply as soon as possible. And again, please like, share um, this video uh, with whoever you'd like. I'd like it to be a free resource for anybody who just wants to get started in the world of audio technology and just doesn't know anything. Hopefully this can get them off the ground and started on the right path. And again, I hope you enjoyed this and thanks for joining me.